Hello and welcome to Sue Beagent Interviews, Smart Women Who Mean Business. My name's Sue Beagent and my guest today is Sharon Dietrich and I'm very excited to have what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting conversation. Before we dive in, I'm going to tell you just a little about myself. I help solo entrepreneurs and small business owners who've had a successful career or life-changing experiences who they're now turning into a business. I'm a business coach. I help them transform from best kept secret to having a reliable flow of paying clients. And if you'd like to know more, find me at www.cocreationzone.com. This is the fourth in uh, my series of interviews. And uh, if you missed the first three, here's just a quick recap. My first guest was Linda Lavera Waterhouse, who talked about LinkedIn. And if you're wondering whether LinkedIn really matters for your business, just Google yourself. And if, particularly if you're a business owner, make sure that profile counts. My second uh, guest was Anne Groth, who's a daily money manager. And daily money management is one of these new professions that's coming into being. She uh, told us about this whole new area where uh, daily money managers go and help people, particularly those who are in transition, for instance, somebody who's re recently widowed, particularly if you maybe have a, an elderly parent who's been left, who doesn't know how to manage all of the bills and the legal things that come in. Find a daily money manager and start with Anne Groth. My last guest last week was Erica Mortimer, who's the author of Slow the F Down. And she talked to us about actually slowing down in your life and at work so you can become more productive and happier in your life. And if you're interested in any of those interviews, you can find them at my Facebook group, Smart Women Who Mean Business, on my Facebook page, which is Sue Beagent at the Co-Creation Zone, or here at panjradio.com. So now it is time to move into my my first guest today, my fourth interview, and Sharon Dietrich. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Sue. And uh, Sharon is a corporate business leader who reset her personal compass by taking three years out to reconnect with her values and explore her entrepreneurial passion and a passion for championing girls' education and empowering women. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you, Sue. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Certainly. Well, first of all, you can probably hear I'm a long way from home. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I, uh, both are <laughs> <laughs> yes, both of us. So um, I'm from South Africa originally. I grew up in South Africa, went to school there, went went to college, um, and and really only spread my wings um, later on in my in my life. Um, I um, I was very fortunate to um, to be working with an international company who offered me an assignment in Singapore. Uh, I had to go and get the map. Uh, in fact, in those days, I had to phone my brother to stop by the library on the way home from work to pick up a book with a map on Singapore to see where it was. Just shows you how far technology has come, right? right. Today, we would just go to the phone and Google. Absolutely. So, um, ex um, uh, long story short, I um, I got the opportunity to move to Singapore and uh, with the company I was working with and uh, to work across the whole Asia region. And from there, my career took me to, uh, to London, to the UK, and after three years back again to Asia, both Singapore and Shanghai and China. Wow. And I eventually found my way to, to the US almost 10 years ago. Uh -huh. so, so here I am in Lambertville. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's quite a journey and that's quite a cultural um, uh, mm. exposure. That, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very, and an enormous amount of change has happened in all of those regions, including in the US in that time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it, it really it opened my eyes up, I think, at, a, at an early age to um, differences and similarities. We often focus on the, the differences, mm. but a lot of similarities in, in cultures, um, talking about gender and diversity and, and other things as well. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm very fortunate to have had that experience. And yes. It's probably why I'm passionate about the causes I am today. Too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure. I'm sure mm -hmm. it was absolutely life shaping. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So today you're a business leader. Yes. And, um, and you've really just told us that you've had an amazing um, set of experiences that have really made you who you are today in business. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love for you to talk about some of the influences that have sort of supported your career and that trajectory um, 
So tell us more. Right. Yes. Well, I, th I wish I could point to one or two um, key influences, but the truth is I think I've had several. Mm -hmm. And I think I've had different influences at different stages of my life and my career. And, um, and sometimes it, your influences are not actually the Pro, you know, not not uh, uh, necessarily the positive influences, but things you're watching and seeing on the side and thinking, I don't want to be like that. <laughs> yeah. And that sometimes stirs something inside you. And, and that's one of the things I think I learned <clears throat> very early on was to listen to my intuition and to to take chances um, and to really branch out. It, it wasn't always comfortable for me. And in fact, I think it was it was downright scary sometimes for me yeah. to, to take these um, opportunities. But um, that being said, um, I think that there are several people. First of all, I think from a, a family perspective, um, while it might not have been on the top of the um, the list for, for me as the only girl in my family to go to college and become a professional, it certainly was, you know, either get married or find a job, <laughs> right. do something productive. Um, I was fortunate enough to be, uh, to have a lot of friends and family support in terms of pursuing my college degree. Mm. And when the opportunity came up to actually um, take an international assignment, I was supported 100% by my family. Uh, everyone thought I'd be home in a month. Well, I'm still not home. <laughs> it's 20 years yes. plus. But yes. um, I think that's the most important thing is having that support and that mentorship. And sometimes it's not it, that, that people don't need to necessarily agree with what you're doing, but they need to support you. So I've had a lot of that. And then I think in business itself, I was very lucky to work with some fantastic business leaders. And the truth is most of them were men. In fact, mm. pretty much all of them were men. And I had some great mentors that, that came from that at different stages in my career that really Really taught me a lot about business and to look at uh, at business through a um, you know through 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 a very strong business lens mm. and um, I just soaked it up like a sponge I learned everything that I could and I utilized that in the way in which I operate and, and the way in which I, I continued my career so I think ha again having those different business leaders and and a different stages have really helped influence me mm. um, and that's probably another reason again why you know we talk about empowerment there were not that many women out there as role models yeah so as you climb the ladder what I learned probably much later on than than I, I, I wish I had of was the fact that as women as we as we work whether it's entrepreneurial in our own business or in a corporate environment any environment we are role models for other women yes. and I find myself now really examining everything I do um, very carefully through the lens of my niece for example and my niece's friends and and all of my you know godchildren and and my, my friends children I look at myself through a different lens and I think that's the other thing now we are the influencers um, yeah so I think you know if, if I go back to your question in terms of key influences I think a lot of different um, influential factors some of them um, corporate driven, some of them family driven, and then also um, finding role models in society that you look up to, you know, again, just to help shape you. So of course, being South African, Nelson Mandela, I say who. <laughs> uh, you yes. know, just, uh, just the humanity, being human. He, he is, mm -hmm. he's, he is a male leader who has that, that softness and that quality. He has the, you know, in terms of you look about right from the beginning, right, of his championing his cause, um, uh, pretty violent, pretty brutal, but also passionate about what he believed and and the the heart at which he came mm. to South Africa at the time he was made, um, you know, the leader was was that for me is um, just it showed a different side, right? And he wasn't afraid to show that side, the way in which he engaged in society. And so, that side, you mean the softer side? The softer side, mm. yes, yes. Yeah. So so really drawing on what some people might call that more feminine side within mm. us, right? The masculine and the feminine. Um, but really using his heart and his intuition um, and not just not just the process or what was expected, right? You know, it's so interesting that you say that. If anybody is listening or watching right now and you actually watched last week's episode, this was so much of what I talked about right. with Eric Mortimer um, and about the, you know, each individual has both the male and the female. But we tend to, as women, suppress the female mm feeling more intuitive side mm -hmm. at work just because we don't have a lot of models that show us how that can be. Mm -hmm. So that's very yeah. encouraging actually. Yeah. To, uh, and it was so encouraging to hear you say that part of your journey was using your intuition. 
Definitely. I think that's, uh, it's something, it, it's so easily squashed, especially in a corporate mm -hmm. environment, or when we become, uh, we question ourselves too much, I think, and we become uncertain, men and women, but I think sometimes women more so, and that's when we suppress that intuition, and, and I think that it doesn't serve us well. I think it's a mm -hmm. strength and a capability that we have that we should utilize more. Uh, I couldn't mm -hmm. agree with you more. Mm -hmm. I know that it, you know, it's easy when the pressure is off to think about these things and, and sort of feel our way into them. But um, so often in a corporate environment, the pressure is on to meet a goal, mm -hmm. meet a deadline. And that's often when the, it's much harder to listen mm -hmm. to your intuition, particularly if you're in a large corporation and the sea of opinion seems to be heading in the opposite mm -hmm. way to the in intuition. Yeah. So it's, it's great to hear you talk about that. I, I love that. I love that. <laughs> So what do you think about being a woman as opposed to a man influence your life career progression? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think early on in my career, I would say that um, growing, uh, growing up, you know, from a um, career perspective in a pretty conservative country, very male dominated at the time. Um, that I definitely was shaped by trying to find a position where, I've, where it was acceptable for a woman to be. So I would mm. say, you know, looking back, I wish I had been bolder in terms of looking at different career opportunities. Uh, I, it was t it, it, I, I went for the safe option. Yes. Um, looking back there, but I think that. Um, so I think that being a woman probably influenced some of my decisions at an early stage. I don't. Mm. I don't regret anything. Um, I've had the most incredible opportunities. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, d working in a, in, a, in a corporate environment as a woman um, at a younger age was much more challenging than it is now. Mm. And I but wonder sometimes yeah. if you yeah. grow into your comfort. I feel I've grown, I've grown in confidence. Mm. I'm more comfortable with who I am. Yes. I'm more comfortable being who I am. Whereas when I was younger, I felt that I had to try and be someone else. And you touched on it earlier, right? And, mm. and I think finding that balance actually physically, just the way in which you present yourself at work. And, you know, just actually just driving here earlier, I was just reflecting and I was thinking of my, my mom, you know, if she was here, she first, you know, I can still remember the first days going to work. You had to wear pantyhose you couldn't wear trousers <laughs> yes. you had to wear heels you know and I've got flats on and I've got skinny trousers and they come down to my ankle and I don't have pantyhose on and, <laughs> and I feel fantastic yes. and you know what it hasn't it impacted my career or my brain in any way whatsoever so I think those things definitely influenced me in that environment at a much mm. younger age um, and then I think the other side um, trying to find that balance between being who I am as a woman operating in a male-dominated environment. I still operate in a male-dominated mm. environment. It is not uncommon for me to be around a table uh, with, with me being maybe one out of um, 12 people and um, the only female, yes. or maybe two in a group of, of 10. So um, I think really being being true to yourself and understanding the value that you bring and not trying to be like everyone else, because when we try to be like everyone else, operating in an environment that is male-dominated, we're then trying to be more male-like. Male. Yes. And um, and that's that's just not that for me was not comfortable. It's yes. everyone is different. So I think just finding that balance and and I've seen from my perspective in, in careers, you know, um, a lot of my, my female colleagues struggle with that balance between either being too forceful and mm. too strong outside their comfort zones you should be who you are but mm. don't try and be someone else um, and the other thing I would say is that I also see a lot of women trying to be more the mother you know and I find myself going to the kitchen making tea and cleaning the counters like who left the coffee <laughs> cup out and putting it away yeah. you know yeah. and I laugh and and those things are fun but but just um you know what what is your role um as a mm. female leader and and how do you find that true sort of sense of self uh, in a male-dominated world I, I'm sort of interested um, because I have very much recognized that, that struggle. And I don't think when I was in my corporate career that I really found that balance. Mm -hmm. I was in my last role, um, the only woman in, you know, the team that was working on a, on a launch and it was hard. Um, in some ways I, f I didn't feel as, I didn't really think about being a woman, mm -hmm. but then I would catch myself actually thinking about, gosh, I better pick up this detail and this detail because if they don't, Thing, the whole thing won't work. The things that weren't mine. Yes. Um, and not allowing other people to, 
to take mm -hmm. the responsibility for what would happen if it didn't happen. Yeah. Because, yeah. It's, it's and I see, I see that a lot. I see that with mm -hmm. some of my colleagues. Uh, I've seen that in myself, mm -hmm. trying to pick up and fill up the gaps and make sure no one falls off. Yes. Um, and, and I think that I don't necessarily find that reciprocated, right? It's different yes. if you're working in a team. It doesn't matter what gender you are, you'll support each other. But from my experience, typically as women, we tend to go above and beyond and try and make up for everyone. Yes. So that was a good, uh, a good learning experience for me on, on my journey, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I, I, I relate to so much of this. Uh, uh, can I say one other thing on that, Sue, hmm. too, as a woman? I think the other thing that I learned, uh, right, is that, um, and I see this still in, in corporate careers, women wait to be tapped on the shoulder or yes. to be asked to do something. Yes. And, or for and, a raise. Or for a raise. Or yeah. how do I go about asking for a raise yeah. or never asking for a raise. Yes. Uh, and that's fine if that's how you feel. This is not a one size fits all. Yes. But I do feel that um, that men tend to network better. They are by virtue more, in, in many organizations, they're more men than women anyway. Yes. The networking is different and stronger and has been stronger for a longer period of time. I think that, that we are now learning to network much more effectively as women, as women leaders. I see mm. it. It's fantastic to see. LinkedIn is an amazing tool because it allows you to find organizations that you can connect with and follow and and, and become part of to build your networking environment. But in the in the corporate environment too, I feel that um, that um, you know men men tend to ask for what they want, and women don't tend to ask as much. So looking back mm. at myself, and I look back to my early careers, there's things I would ask for now. You yes. know, feeling more comfortable mm -hmm. and having learned that. Yeah. So I think whether you got your own business, um, you got daughters, uh, you know, early in their careers, that's something that I think we should all be conscious of. Is we shouldn't be afraid to ask. Um, for what we think is is right. I, I it's so heartening for me to mm. hear you say that. It's actually one of the things that I find with women business owners. We struggle to own our own value, to really stand in mm -hmm. our value. You know, particularly early on when somebody's trying to nickel and dime you a little bit mm -hmm. because they're because really they're trying to find out where your boundaries are. Right. And um, so it's so important to own mm -hmm. that that value. Okay. So. What do you thought? Because things are changing for women. You you said uh, a little earlier that you didn't think things would be the same for you know the generation of women who are following. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. interested to pick up that point and hear what what you meant. You know when you yeah. said that. Yeah, I, I think I think things are changing a lot. I, I'm very um, heartened about the change. Having said that, I don't um, don't sit around feeling disheartened. Right. <laughs> I'm very yes. much a future yeah. focused person. Yeah. To yeah. me, it's about what can I do today and what can I do tomorrow. It's not about what mm -hmm. what I, I could have done yesterday. Um, and it's the small things that count sometimes. But um, you know, I do think that if I if I uh, look at the younger generations coming through, I do feel that there's a much more sense of gender equality. Mm. And I think that it's it's our generation now that is influencing the next generation. Again, going back to that role modeling and, and being mm. aware of the messages that we give um, the young, the, you know, the young children coming up, me, boys and girls, right? Both mm. in terms of gender um, equality. Yeah. So d I think that uh, I think that things are changing. We see it. Um, I can see it in the corporate environment. It might be slow, but it's changing. You can see it in the momentum behind some of the, the groups and women's networking groups. Mm. Uh, can see it just in on LinkedIn. You know, I follow a lot of various sites. Right. You can see the momentum growing. Um, you can see the influence women are having as consumers. And for me, that's powerful. And, and if I think about you, Sue, in your business, there are more and more women that want to work with women. Yes. And uh, and for me, I, I, one of my passions, many passions, is art and collecting. I now have a, a, an urge to know more about female artists mm. and to collect female yeah. artists. And, yeah. and I can't explain why. It's just a passion, right? Yes. But it's almost supporting and, and celebrating what we what we have as women. So I, I think there's more and more of it happening, um, and especially on the consumer side and the entrepreneur side. I'm so encouraged to hear that because I don't really interact as much as you do mm -hmm. with um, the generation of women coming behind us. We're going to take a short break right now because we're actually going to take a quick look at something else that Sharon is very passionate about. It's an organization called She's the First, and we'll be back in a moment. Welcome. 
If you've just joined us, my name's Sue Beagent and I'm your host today. All the guests on my show are members of my Facebook group, Smart Women Who Mean Business. And if that's you, please come and join us. It's my great pleasure to be interviewing Sharon Dietrich. Sharon's a corporate business leader with a very impressive career who recently reset her personal compass by taking three years out to reconnect with her values, becoming an entrepreneur in the process. Along the way, she became a passionate champion of girls' education and supporting the empowerment of women. Today, she's sharing her personal journey and her commitment to a phenomenal organization called She's the First, who through the education, mentorship and leadership training of girls fights global gender inequality. More details in the last part of our show. Please stay with us. Interested to learn more or consider a donation? Here's how you can make an impact on a girl's life. Follow the link. She's the first forward slash donate. Or email Sharon at Sharon Dietrich at hotmail.com. And if you're listening and not uh, watching, that's Sharon, D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H at hotmail.com. Here's to making a difference. I love that. We're going to be talking quite a lot about She's the First in the last section of our show. But right now, we're actually going to have a change of pace because... Sharon, you actually had uh, a change in career, didn't you? You haven't always worked in a corporate role. So we'd love to hear all about that because uh, clearly what led you to take a break? Yeah, um, you're right, Sue. It, uh, I took a break for about three years from corporate career. And um, what, what led to that was, um, was probably the fact that I, I felt that I'd lost my way a little bit. I'd become consumed by my corporate career. Um, and it was uh, it, it was basically taking over my life, mm -hmm. and I was struggling to find that balance. Um, you know, looking back, I think I could have probably done it differently, but I decided at the time the best thing for me was to take some time out. And there were some key drivers. Um, you know, I have a family in South Africa. Um, I have family in Australia. I have family in the UK. <laughs> and yeah. I have, uh, you know, obviously a lot of friends around the world. And, um, you know, I just felt that with every single trip abroad to see my parents or my family, uh, it was being consumed, half the time was being consumed by, by, by work-related mm, uh, right. issues. And I wasn't giving the quality. And it, I really woke up one day and realized my, my father, um, who I adore, and I'll probably have to send this video link to, um, uh, has um, diabetes and he has, um, he has some, some um, side effects from that. And one of them actually is um, the, he's losing the ability to walk effectively. Mm. Um, so he's suffering from neuropathy. And, you know, my father's been very active all his life as a soccer coach. And I realized that um, there weren't going to be that many more years we could walk together. And and and, and we mm. both love doing that. And um, that was kind of a wake up call for me, you know, that here mm. I am squashing everything in. And uh, just those small things like walking on the beach for 15 or 20 mm. minutes or going to the supermarket were suddenly becoming precious um, times in terms of activity, right? Yes. Um, so... That was probably a key driver for me and the fact that I was squashing everything in and nothing was getting done effectively. Um, so I decided to take a break and it was scary. I'll be honest, it was terrifying. Even after I handed my resignation and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Who am I? Because I had become <laughs> yes. this person that identity. was, yes, yeah. it was all about work. And mm. uh, even within my family, they, they knew me as this business person. And uh, my niece and nephews, you know, um, I could tell you some funny stories. But uh, so I really wanted to, t to take the time to, to step back and reconnect. And um, I did. I spent three years. And the first year, I really didn't do too much. Apart of the, uh, I worried. Uh, I got very healthy and very fit, <laughs> which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I reset my whole clock, you know, everything, mm -hmm. my, my yeah. health, what was important to me. I was spending probably three to four weeks in South Africa every three months or so. Oh, wow. And yeah. reconnecting with my, my, um, my family. Yeah. Uh, not that I hadn't been connected, but just in a different way yeah. um, and being, being around them much more. So that to me was very, very special. 
Mm. Um, and um, and that's actually what led me to to look for something, look for a purpose on what I wanted to do. And I wanted to try something outside of the corporate environment. And I love business and mm. I love the business of business. And um, I also said earlier, I love art and yeah. um, I love crafts. And one of my most favorite things in the whole world in South Africa is seeing the beautiful beadwork and the craft work that, that the women do, especially where I grew up in, in Natal. Um, and, um, and I decided that could be a starting point for me to start looking at my own business. And, um, and from there, I started looking into uh, working with some of the organizations Big decisions to be made. Who do you work with? Um, how do and you what, work? What types of organisations? Well, um, do I work with individuals? Do I work with uh, profit organisations? Do I work with non-profit organisations? Mm. So there's a lot of non-profit organisations in South Africa and a lot of them supporting craft. So that was a learning curve for me to, to see how they operated. And, um, and I did want to work with the non-profits. And that experience actually made me realise with my business hat on um, and my my... Um, I think the, the the desire to see these women succeed mm. is how can we help women like that to succeed better? The actual artists themselves. The artists themselves, the people mm. creating these pieces. And there, there's there's definitely not a silver bullet to this, but but it did make me start thinking about all the things that impacted um, uh, you know the, the, the these women in terms of craftsmen. And we touched on it earlier, right? Just um, first of all, um, having an opportunity to display your 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 wares and your goods, mm. um, and also charging. Um, fair prices and earning a living, earning a decent living. And how do you do that without always operating through a nonprofit environment, mm. which tend to keep prices and need to keep prices at a rate that are going to attract buyers yes. um, to their goods? And there's a, and a, and I, and I appreciate that so much. But I was trying to think, what next for some of these women? What could what could the future look like? Mm. Um, and and even as part of that, what would the future look like without the skill set being being transferred? Because a lot of the newer generation, the younger generations come coming through, rats are looking for something different in terms of, of career, are having the opportunity to, to get educated, or, or maybe not. Um, but I could also see those traditions dying out in terms of the traditional craft, yeah. um, beading techniques, etc. Yes. So it's yeah, something that I, d I became very passionate about and looked at in terms of how could I make this into a business. So tell us, you know, because I think you, you took it from there and you did um, start to make it a business. So talk, yes. talk to us about Yes. You know, um, well, I, 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 I definitely started. I de I, I, it's um, to be continued. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and having learned so much from you, I know now what I would do differently. Um, and also, it, 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 this for me was a time I really wanted to... Um, uh, I wanted to go back into corporate for, for a very specific reason, mm. and uh, and this is literally on hold. This is this is something I will go back to and yeah. I will do, uh, and that's you know everyone knows that. Um, I think that um, how I made this happen was actually spending time with a lot of these nonprofits, mm. meeting some of the the women that that run them. And then getting to know some of the crafters themselves, right. and to see the work that they that they did, and then taking taking that and thinking about how would you how would I make this a business? And f there were small small details um, that have become very important. For example, colors. What are the mm -hmm. trends? Um, we were living in an environment now where everything is instant, right? You can go on literally Instagram, right? On on yeah. um, on Google, you can see what the current trends are. You can watch live fashion shows. How could you tap into these current trends? and this beautiful craft work and get the two to combine in the middle, yes. yes and yes. so that that's really that's really what i was trying to do so i am um, i was fortunate to meet the most wonderful woman um and quite a few of them who really helped me um taught me um, a lot about how the, the beads are made the pieces are made and allowed me to actually interfere and to redesign pieces design my own pieces um and to, and to look at my own color schemes oh, so everything so you got to express your creative yes. side as well as your business side correct yeah. correct yes yeah. and that was the whole point is trying to make the two meet yeah. um with my business hat on and my, and my passion and understanding the role of the of the um the non-profit organization and it's interesting because um, i know we're going to talk about this a little bit more but i uh, when we talked about this 
you talked about actually empowering the women so that they were no longer reliant on the nonprofit, but in fact were able to stand in their own power mm -hmm. as artists and as businesswomen themselves. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I think that it's, it's, for me, it's important if we look to the future that we're not always relying on someone else for something, right? Mm. I think for me, relying, um, you know, I think education underpins it all, but how do we make or how do we help women become independent? And it, there's, there's a lot of factors involved, but for me, a, a key part of that was, first of all, um, having the ability to be able to show what you make in the right places and mm. also then charging the right prices. Mm. And I felt that the, 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 char the prices that were linked to some of these products weren't always um, reflective of the work that went in. Yeah. So I actually spoke with a couple of the beaders to see how long does it take to make this necklace? Tell me how you go about it. How many hours or days? Like the one you're wearing. Necklace like the one I'm wearing. Yes. My favorite. So, um, and there are some pieces that take days to make. And when mm. you look at the price and you worked it out to an hourly, even in the local economy, it really wasn't very much at all. And and Probably my tiny. my concern mm. was that as long as there's someone to sell it to, and to get a rate, um, even if it's not sold on, that that value would never change, right? And that appreciation and that self-worth for the work being done would never change. Mm. A lot of the women that are making these pieces are actually older women. Um, in South Africa, we would say gogos and grandmothers. Uh, a lot of them work at night. They look after children during the day or grandchildren. Right. A lot of these families have been impacted by HIV and AIDS mm. and are looking after generations of children and grandchildren. And a lot of the the, um, the beads are done now to the point that sometimes I get um, pieces that have been handcrafted for me. I can smell the fire, and oh, it's really? uh, yes, it's oh, it's wow. a fantastic it's fantastic <laughs> for me. It's, it's a heart sort brings back wow. uh, all the feelings of home and emotions. But but to, the women are sitting at the fire firelight at night, um, beading at wow. at night around the fire for light. So a lot of these are made in rural areas. Not all of them. But um, and that's really got me thinking about how do we start to empower these women and how do we start to impact the next generations to either do what they love doing and put it and, and make sure that they get the, the value from it, mm. um, because I think it's important to 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 continue those traditions. Yeah. And then how do we just empower women generally? Right. How do we help mm. these women get out um, of some of these situations and, and give them a platform to shine. And if you are a woman in that situation and you have never been exposed to thinking any other way, there doesn't seem like another way. And I'm sure, um, I can't imagine how amazing it must have been for them to be, to have, you, you know, the two of you to, or to all of you to interact and to hear this whole new idea of, wow, there could be a different way. Mm -hmm. There could be more in this for me. This mm -hmm. could actually really support us. Mm. That's a very different thing. Yes, yes. I think uh, I think one of the nonprofits I worked with in, in particular uh, was very open and welcoming of the ideas and suggestions mm. and, uh, and and really encouraged the work and and also raised the bar in terms of some of the, the, the quality of the work. And that's what was a really good learning for me, you know, because in the beginning I was like, okay, I want these this piece to be silver, light gray, dark gray with a tiny little bit of uh, gold. And the piece would come out. I think, what got lost in translation? That's not dark gray. That's not light gray. And and yeah. it was lost in translation because that was for them or there weren't enough beads of yes. that color. So they were substituted. They used their initiative. Yes. And and it, it took a lot of learning for me to un uh, appreciate what they were doing and for them to appreciate what I was trying to do. Yes. A meeting of the minds. And one of the things that I learned was sometimes when you are not in control and things just happen the way they're supposed to be, they're actually more beautiful. And imperfection oh, imperfection that. actually is perfect sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you go to, the, initially your heart sinks and you think, I didn't want red, I wanted blue. And then you look again and you think, wow, that's beautiful. Oh. Thank you for doing it in red. It's actually much better than blue. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so yeah. you know, just learning that appreciation, mm -hmm. I think, um, and trusting that, um, that, that sometimes these women actually know better than you in terms of what looks good. That's a great mm -hmm. philosophy for mm -hmm. life. Never mind when something comes back. I mean, absolutely. Really, yeah. Absolutely. It's something yeah. that I've taken back with me from, a, it, 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 you know, we talk about resetting, right, and taking that time mm. out. It's one of the, my key learnings um, that, I, that I carry with me now is just not looking for that perfection. And if mm. something isn't done the way you want it, is it still good? 
change the way in which you look at it. If you if you hadn't have given something to be done that way, mm. and you came in from fresh, what does it look like? And sometimes actually, it's 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 pretty nice. I love I love 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 mm-hmm. that. Wow, that's a great life. That's just a life lesson, <laughs> <laughs> right there. So this must have really transformed who you who you are. Now. You did go back to your corporate career after mm-hmm. your th- three years out. So what were some yeah. of the key things that you took with you when you went back that you mm. didn't have mm. when you left? Well, this is really good timing for me to reflect on this right now as, a, as I, I'm so busy at work. But um, and quite a few things, Sue, to be honest. And starting, I think, on a very personal level is just owning my own time. Mm. And if I'm giving, I don't believe that there's a perfect balance. You know, the the work-life balance is fluid. And there's some days it's more work and there's some days it's more life. And overall, it has to feel good and comfortable for us. Mm. So I think that was something that I took away was if I'm going to be spending much more time on the work side, then it must be something I love and I enjoy and it feels right, it feels good. Mm. And when I need to take more time on the life side, don't feel guilty yeah. Don't feel that I have to justify it and and don't look at it on an on a hour by hour and day to day basis because that doesn't work. I, I give so much more in other times. So if I look back, I think that was one of the things I would have done differently, not to mm. necessarily have have left for a three year period. I think if I look back what I could have done differently in managing my corporate career. So mm. I think um, I just think as women, we tend to uh, judge ourselves a little bit harshly when it comes to um, anything that we do that is not related to work in terms of the overall hours. So that's one of the things I've taken away. The other thing is just what I touched on earlier is not looking for perfection. Yeah. And it's not about the way that uh, that sometimes I want things to be done, but it's about is does it look good and have other people had enough input? So really appreciating mm. what diversity and what teams bring to something. And even if I have a vision, sometimes be flexible, let that shift and, and look mm. for what others can bring that could be better than what you even started in the beginning. Wow. So, so mm. some key takeaways for me, I think. And the other thing I would say is not to lose sense of who you are. At the oh. end of every day, to check in and feel comfortable about who you are and what you've done for that day and what you're going to do. And you get up in the morning and you take a breath, right? Um, I was going to say, how and, do you do that? Tell us how you do that. Well, you know, it, it's not always easy. And there's yeah. some days it, it just doesn't work, to be honest with right. you. Yeah. And, and that's another yeah. thing, right? You're not looking for perfection, but yeah. it, it's like a continuous journey of of self-discovery and, and how do we work in today's environment? You've got mm-hmm. the phone, it's 24 seven. I have two phones, a personal phone, a work phone. Yeah. You've got everything else. Um, I think it is a journey, but a couple of things that I've been practicing recently, um, I'm trying to get up a little bit earlier and I'm trying to take, even if it's 15 minutes to do a walk, the weather's nice, so it's great. When it's not indoors on the treadmill, it does. Just to clear your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I read a great article a few weeks ago on, on gratitude nice. and waking up in the morning and just choosing three things I'm grateful for. And what I found recently is I'm, gone, I'm on item four, five, six. Okay, that's enough now. I need to get out of bed. So just starting <laughs> with some yeah. simple practices. Um, but I think most of all, at the end of a day, whether that day is 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the evening, just reflecting on how you've spent your time and would you do anything different, learning for the mm-hmm. next day. And when you go to bed, just know that you feel good with what you've done. So if I haven't emailed my brother back or he sent out my niece's WhatsApp to me, um, why, you know, why didn't I get to it and, uh, and when am I going to get to it? So never forgetting it, that you've got a, a full life and you need to juggle all these balls. The people right? are important. Important. People are critical, mm. and and I can tell you, that even living here in this, this beautiful uh, city um, of Lambertville, right? Just getting to know people has has been a big part of that three year mm. uh, journey too. So taking the time off wasn't just about family, wasn't just about this entrepreneurial um, adventure. I really made friends, and mm. today I look around Lambertville. You're one of them. The friends that I have, I would not have if I hadn't have taken that time to step aside and reevaluate yes. what I want in my life. Yes. And I want friends. I want dear friends. I've moved a lot, so it's hard to keep touch uh, with friends. And I made a conscious effort that I was going to build a community, and um, and that was important to me. And that's one of the things I check in on. And yeah. I know that any of my friends are listening. They're probably thinking I haven't replied to the emails, but I will. <laughs> I will get there. But uh, but now you know that she's thinking of you and she cares. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's such a pleasure to talk with you. Mm-hmm. I, I have to say it's been a privilege to do all of these interviews. I learn 
things and I'm reminded of things every single time I do it. <laughs> so if, uh, if you've just joined us and perhaps you haven't been here for all of our interview, we're going to take a short break uh, to a video right now. We're going to talk about um, an organization that Sharon is very passionate about called She's the First and you're about to learn a little bit more about that. But stay with us because we're really going to dive in with the rest of our show. Welcome. If you've just joined us, my name's Sue Beagent and I'm your host today. All the guests on my show are members of my Facebook group, Smart Women Who Mean Business. And if that's you, please come and join us. It's my great pleasure to be interviewing Sharon Dietrich. Sharon's a corporate business leader with a very impressive career who recently reset her personal compass by taking three years out to reconnect with her values, becoming an entrepreneur in the process. Along the way, she became a passionate champion of girls' education and supporting the empowerment of women. Today, she's sharing her personal journey and her commitment to a phenomenal organization called She's the First, who through the education, mentorship and leadership training of girls fights global gender inequality. More details in the last part of our show. Please stay with us. Interested to learn more or consider a donation? Here's how you can make an impact on a girl's life. Follow the link. She's the first forward slash donate. Or email Sharon at Sharon Dietrich at hotmail.com. And if you're listening and not uh, watching, that's Sharon, D-I-E-T-R-I-C-H at hotmail.com. Here's to making a difference. So, we're in the final third of our show. If you haven't been uh, watching or listening to all of our show, I recommend you go back to the beginning. This is a really <laughs> great interview. But we're going to dive in now to an organization that you um, learned about and then really became involved in. And that organization is called She's the First. So maybe you could tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about She's the First to start with. Sure. So She's the First um, was actually set up about 10 years ago and about two amazing young women, um, Tammy Tibbetts and Kristen Brandt, uh, both uh, pretty local. I think uh, New Jersey and uh, the organization is based in, in New York. Mm. And uh, they had, after their, their college studies, done some travels and um, really felt and seen firsthand the impact of gender inequality when it comes to children's education mm. um, and, and young girls' education and decided to do something about it. So they set up an organization um, to actually look at raising um, raising the awareness of gender inequality. And they, they have, their mission basically is to fight gender inequality mm. through educating young girls. Right. And the focus is on developing countries. But what I love about their model, Sue, is that they actually, um, it's not just about providing the education, they provide a whole support structure around that. So they made a conscious uh, decision when they set up their foundation that they were going to make sure that the girls succeeded. Mm -hmm. And to do that, they focused on, on three areas, it was the education, it was the mentorship, and then, and then leadership training as well. Yeah. And the model very much started out very grassroots. They looked at all the um, local colleges and schools and for girls to set up chapters to actually um, raise funds. And what I really love about this is that there's benefits on both sides. You know, I'm, I, I'm a firm believer in that you need to look after everyone in your backyard as well as I, I, yes. the world, right? Yes. <laughs> Somehow you need to find a balance, for me personally. Yes. Um, but what I like about this model is that with all the chapters being set up in a lot of schools, universities across, uh, across the country here in the U.S., um, those girls actually get a chance to go through the, the chapter members through their leadership training program, and they get to, to connect with these young scholars that come in um, for leadership training as well. So, so it benefits both groups. 
that's a very interesting. Actually, mm -hmm. that's something I, I didn't, I uh, hadn't realized. So there, so the girls come here to the states not all of them but some of the girls will come here to be trained as mentors uh -huh. and they'll go through the leadership training okay. they have leadership training locally yeah. in the countries they will provide leadership training but every summer they bring a group of the a group of girls across to the u.s um in the at the to their mentorship um uh, meeting mm -hmm. and leadership training and they have a mix then of some of the chapter students here from the u.s and some of the, the she's the first scholars that are actually being educated and being trained as mentors so it's a great it's a great opportunity for the two to meet. Yeah. Uh, and also it's a great opportunity in terms of um, just global leadership training, right, for, for these young girls to see um, a different part of the world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And to be exposed to different ways of thinking, which is what we Completely. were talking about. Yeah, Completely. absolutely. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So this organization is particularly compelling for you. Um, it is. Uh, you know, there's so many, there's so many good causes, right? There's, there's thousands and thousands. But and you can't. Uh, you, you know, I think um, for me, this has become a big cause. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it probably goes back to my roots, back to South Africa, um, back to seeing just how difficult it was for a lot of women, and especially women that, that were in the rural areas, not being, um, not being, um, Provide, education not being provided, um, not a lot of job opportunity really because it was more male dominated. Um, you know, even uh, if it was supervisor or managerial level, um, it was much more male dominated. Yeah. And then again, the impact of HIV is severe on on our country in South Africa, and and a lot of women and grandmothers are looking after children um, at home and mm. losing generations. And I do feel that that is the starting point is just those those young girls and getting that education. So she's the mm. first focuses on education of the first girls, um, first girl in the in a family to go to high school. That is their focus okay. area. Mm -hmm. So it's not um, it's not necessarily the second or third. It's to get it's to get the first girl in the family into high school and to graduate through high school and to have all this other education around them and support around them. It's not college and it's not anything else. Yeah. Um, but for me, that's the foundation. And, and, and having seen that even in my travels a lot in Asia, um, and having seen how many girls don't get to school, mm -hmm. I think the latest statistics from She's the First are something like, um, there. I think it's 64 million girls who do not get to go to secondary school. Mm -hmm. 64 million. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. almost the population of the United Kingdom. Right? Yes. It's an enormous amount. Yeah. And two-thirds of, um, two of, of illiterate adults a woman. Yes. So it goes back again to that education of those girls and just getting that high school education is so important. Mm. So as I said, there are so many good causes, but for me, this one really tack it was a root cause tackle. Um, and I love the way in which they do it with those three pillars of the education, mm. the mentorship and the, um, the leadership training. Yes. It, it adding up to sort of really supporting, mm -hmm. not just leaving them with the education and not with no support behind them. Yes, correct. Yeah. And in fact, if, if you go onto their, their website, uh, she's the first, um, uh, dot org, you can actually watch some videos. And there's some videos that are, that are very um, heartwarming, but very... Um, educational in terms of young girls coming out of poverty-stricken areas. One girl in particular um, that came from the quarry areas in India, slept in a hut, um, had no bed, mm. no bathroom, no kitchen. Um, her mother, <clears throat> excuse me, had, um, had been widowed. And, uh, and going to school and having a bed, having a bathroom, wow. Having, mm. um, you know, having food cooked and prepared, sitting at a table eating with cutlery, just completely different experience. Mm. Um, that yet particular young girl that I'm talking about actually is now, um, she's doing uh, research. Um, and I think she's actually, if, um, I don't want to speak out of term, but I think she's affiliated with one of the institutions in, uh, in, in South India, actually um, looking at um, working in the hospitals and in research. And she's particularly interested in brain in the, in the oh, area wow. of the brain and brain research. Mm. But can you imagine the impact of her education on not just her, yeah. but her family mm. and the family around them? Yes. It's pretty significant. But she wouldn't have done that just by getting education. She yes. had the counseling, she had health education, she had sex education, she had mentors, um, she had all the support she needed to yeah. give her that, that power to make a difference. And it, 
I'm sure for the first time it shows both her family and those communities that this is possible mm -hmm. and what this means. Absolutely. And, open, and also mm -hmm. starts to open up the world for them yes. as well as for the girl. It's yes. amazing. So where does most of the money come from that supports She's the First? She's the first um, look for donations in various forms. First, I'd say that they have an operations fundraising arm, which covers their operating costs. Mm -hmm. And then they have the education, which purely goes to the education of these young uh, young girls. And that's what the group that I'm involved in actually supports the education of the young girls. So okay. they're, they're separated. But in terms of the donations, uh, actually the majority of the, the donations, um, most of the um, donations come from individual donors. I think it's something like 35, uh, with my cheat sheet here somewhere, 36% mm. of their donations are made up from individual donors. Wow. And then about 32% from corporate, uh, you know, corporations or foundations. That yeah. that makes up the kind of you know seventy odd percent of the the donations that they receive, but that's why I say that, that what I love about was just this grassroots beginning with college students um, making cupcakes and selling tada T-shirts to raise money for she's the first, and that's how it's actually swelled was very much from from the the grassroots up. So tell me about because this this actually is something that there's a, a local group here mm -hmm. who are really um, and I know that you're you've been involved from. Close to the beginning, so I'm really right. interested to yes. hear the story of how that came to be and what it is today. Yes, so this is how I actually got to know about She's the First. Um, I uh, I um, was actually at the chiropractor one day. I met this most amazing woman, who tall and statuesque, who looked at me, take my shoes off, and said, "Oh, I wish I had small little shoes like that." And I looked at her and I said, "I wish I was tall and statuesque <laughs> like you." Sorry. And we laughed, and we've been friends since then. So that was that was our dear um, Lee McKay. And um, and she then said, you must come to my um, my May Day event. I uh, held it last year. I have a group of women together. Um, and we celebrate the the women in our community. We celebrate um, everything that we do for each other, how we support each other. And we've linked ourselves to a cause um, to help others. And this, this is where I learned about She's the First. Mm. So that's how I first learned uh, about She's the First. And I went to, to Lee's May Day um, event, um, I think it was a couple of months later, and got to meet the most incredible group of women. This was very early on when I had left the, my, um, my corporate for, for the three years. And I got to, to meet Lee and, um, and her friends and also learn about She's the First. And that was mm. the beginning of the journey. And I think that was almost seven years ago today. Um, wow. that that started and, and that was Lee's second uh, gathering so at that meeting uh, Lee and I spoke afterwards and um, she she wanted to raise more money at the time I think uh, she was raising I think the first event she had 20 people she I think still got two or three thousand uh, dollars the mm -hmm. second one great. was was uh, was three or four and she said wouldn't it be great if we could get more and I said well if you need more money you need more people <laughs> right. and she said if we have more people we need a bigger garden so yeah. I said well Maybe I can help, and that's how I got involved. So, so we held the event at at, um, at my house the following year, mm. and we invited a lot more people. I have to say, we were very anxious. The the, the Mayday Woman, who who, the, who are the, the the committee and the group that that start this, but actually Mayday Woman is everyone that donates to Mayday. Mm. Um, but there's a core committee that that set this up each year and and run it. And, and Lee has been at at the, at the helm of that for many years. Um, we were really anxious to see how it was going to turn out. And uh, that first event where we had, I think we must have about 70 people. That was the third wow. year running. Mm -hmm. uh, we set, I can still remember, that's my business um, side of me saying, right, we're going to get $10,000. Yes. And no way, we're never going to get that. Well, I think we got about $11,000. Oh, we, we overshot. Yes. And that's become the norm now, right? Yeah. That becomes what you want to do each year. Yes. So we've really challenged ourselves to raise more money. And the best thing about this, it's not, the how much money it's the girls that we've impacted so to date Mayday Woman as a collective group have supported 11 girls um, through wow. school and last mm. year we raised enough money to actually ensure that we've completed the schooling for all of these girls right. and we would love to continue this we would love to now um, bring on more girls and support mm. more girls so we're at the beginning of a next cycle and we're also looking for some ways to to, to look at how we can uh, re-energize Mayday Woman yeah. but she's the first um, is the organization that does this all and, and this is the organization that we support. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so how can the people listening or watching get involved? Well, um, I think there's a couple of ways. Firstly, I'd say uh, definitely go online and visit uh, she's the first .org. 
you can make a donation. If you can make a comment, I would love for you to comment at the radio interview or Mayday Woman. Yes, please give us a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Always, um, you know, uh, Sue's show and uh, Mayday Woman uh, would be great. And um, the second thing is um, influence others. Be yes. a change maker. Mm. Be a change maker. It doesn't take a lot. Lee started this Mayday Woman with, you know, 20 friends around a table. We now have sometimes 60 friends around that table, and it's grown and, and, it's, uh, and it's morphed, and it's just wonderful. And I would say you can do that. You, you can have a cocktail party. You can have a luncheon. Uh, you can have a um, triathlon if you want to or a Zumba class mm. and look for a part of the proceeds to to cover um, she's the first and part yeah. of that is education so you can get great materials from the website to educate everyone on she's the first mm. uh, a great example Sue's last year we went our summer party we asked no one to bring wine or flowers or chocolates please rather give a donation we'll, we'll yeah. have a, a bucket out there put a donation in for she's the first yeah. and just with friends and fa- we collected seventeen hundred dollars yeah. I would much rather give that to she's the first than to have another six bottles of wine in my cellar because that <laughs> just makes me put on more weight so um so there's lots of ways in which you can help yeah. and then i'll say the other ways email me i'm 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 happy to help however i can and remind them of your my email, email is my my full name sharon dietrich that's d-i-e-t-r-i-c-h at hotmail.com and uh, I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. And if you're interested in becoming part of our Mayday Woman, email me at that email address, Sharon Dietrich at hotmail.com, and um, I'd love to invite you. Come to the most wonderful party. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. It doesn't matter how small or how large, you know, I think it's contributing to the cause it contributes yeah. to the cause and it all accumulates yes. and i don't think if you ask lee i don't think uh, if she looks back seven years that she thought that we would be in a position today where we've supported mm. 11 girls and probably raised close to fifty thousand dollars over the years over these seven years mm. and it just um it it just it can grow but it does take someone with a vision and with leadership and just the determination to make a difference um, so you have a challenge. wonderful resource here. You know how to contact her. Sharon Dietrich, thank you so very much. It's been a total pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you for sharing all of your experience and thank you for introducing us to this amazing organization. Oh, so, thank you, Sue. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's it was a, a privilege to be on your show. Thank you very much. Pleasure.